started. Uh, my name is Jeff Rathke. I'm the president of the American German Institute at Johns Hopkins University, and I'm really uh, pleased to welcome uh, all of you to this, this webinar, uh, which is about transatlantic economic relations, uh, global economic order, and the impact of the upcoming American elections uh, on, that, uh, on that topic. Uh, we are really pleased to be um, in partnership with the broad consortium, uh, which is coordinated by our friends uh, at Aspen Germany, um, who have uh, helped bring so many organizations together that are working on uh, questions surrounding the election. And uh, I'm really uh, pleased to uh, highlight that we here at AGI have our, our own publication, which was released uh, just last week. You can find it on our website with recommendations for the next uh, US administration. Uh, in a variety of fields. One of those is for the economic relationship between the United States and Europe. And at this point, I'm going to pass things over to uh, my colleague, uh, AGI Vice President and Director of our Geoeconomics Program, Peter Rashish, who is going to uh, moderate and uh, take us through today's program. So Peter, uh, over to you. And I look forward to hearing what, uh, what you and all of our uh, panelists have to say. Thank you, Jeff, and good morning and good afternoon to all of you who are joining us today. And welcome to our webinar on transatlantic economic relations in 2025, global economic order or disorder. Uh, as um, I think we all know, in three just under three weeks, the United States is going to the polls. It's all, I think it's uh, also pretty widely accepted that this is one of the closest elections in the country's history. So there's a lot of uncertainty about the outcome, but um, there is, uh, alongside that uncertainty, there is a sense that there'll be quite um, divergent consequences for the direction of the country, not only domestically, but also internationally, including for the uh, relationship between, the economic relationship between the United States and Europe. Uh, today, we will uh, examine uh, exactly what a Harris or Trump administration would mean for the U.S. EU direct geoeconomic agenda. Uh, I think it's fair to say that whoever's in the White House, he or she will inherit a transatlantic relationship that has moved beyond the contentiousness that often characterized it during the Trump administration, but at the same time, while we've seen a rapprochement in outlook, it hasn't always led to advances in common policy making. I'm thinking of things like the interaction of trade and climate issues, how to do risk from China or the role of the World Trade Organization. So to look at those and other issues, I'm sure um, we have a really excellent uh, lineup of panelists today. Let me introduce them to you briefly. Daniel Behar is a managing director at Rock Creek Global Advisors, where he focuses on international trade and investment policy. From 2016 to 2021, he served as assistant U.S. trade representative for services and investment, and before that was deputy assistant U.S. trade representative for investment. Laura von Daniels has been head of the America's Research Division at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, or in German, Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, which is based in Berlin. Um, she's been there since in that position since 2019, and she focuses there on transatlantic relations and US foreign economic and financial policy. Jacob Kierkegaard is a senior fellow at Bruegel in Brussels and a non-resident senior fellow with our neighbor here in Washington, the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Before that, he was a senior fellow with the Brussels Office of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. And before that, he was a senior fellow here in Washington at the Peterson Institute. Uh, Penny Nass is lead of the German Marshall Fund's Allied Competitiveness Initiative. And she's also an advisor for Trade Experts, which is a global organization of women trade experts. She opened and was also managing director of Citigroup's first government affairs office in Brussels in 2007, uh, before later serving as president for international public affairs and global sustainability at UPS. So I will ask the panelists each to offer some opening remarks. And after that, I will launch a conversation with them and then look forward to opening up the floor to your questions. If you'd like to ask a question, 
As always, please use the Q&A tab on your screen. Why don't we go in the order that I introduce the speakers? So Daniel, um, over to you. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you to AGI and colleagues for the opportunity to, to participate. So 2025, order or disorder? Probably disorder, I think, is my initial reaction. But let's let's begin to break it up, as, as colleagues will do, looking at Trump and Harris generally on this relationship on the economic side, and then, then touching very briefly on a couple of key issues. You, you know, uh, former President Trump has a long-standing, relatively negative view of the EU and the bilateral relationship. He's publicly said many times, you know, that the EU treats the United States worse than China. He the the, the way in which both Trump and many of his key economic advisors look at the EU, uh, first of all, um, each of these trade relationships is examined through the lens of trade deficits and surpluses. And um, the, the EU runs the second largest surplus uh, against the United States, and a number of EU member states also individually run very high surpluses. And from a, a Trump and a, a Trump trade perspective, that's indicative of unfair treatment and a need to rebalance. There also is, is a fundamental difference in view on rules. And it could be, and I've heard former Trump trade officials have said this to EU colleagues, you believe in rules, we don't. <laughs> it's, it's kind of the, the basic idea. And, and I think a lot of folks in the, the Trump trade perspective view the EU not just as believing in rules in a formalistic way, but being a prisoner of rules, believing in these rules, even when others have abandoned them and when the EU may maintain its principles to the detriment of its economic interests, including in the way in which it works with, with China. I think you do see in the EU some debate on that issue taking place. I, I think you, you can look at some of the more pragmatic moves in the previous commission. You can look at Macron, for example, making statements basically on that exact point. You know, why should we be the last economy last major economy you know, that follows these rules when the US and China do not. But, but th that, that set of perspectives, I, I think, is key to understanding how Trump and his key advisors look at Europe. In terms of actions, I, I, I think that you have to take Trump and his key advisors at their word. Most of the things they're saying on trade, I, I think they really want to do. This idea of an across the board tariff of 10 or 20 percent, this idea of a 60 percent tariff on, on, on Chinese imports, um, all of those things I, I think everyone needs to take very seriously as, as, as likely to happen. And there are debates about what type of executive or legislative authority would be needed. But but one way or another, I, I think that these are uh, ideas that are viewed as, as, as serious commitments by the former president and his uh, key advisors. Um, related to that, you know, former USTR Bob Lighthizer, you know, strategically has said and said publicly, you know, first retaliate, then negotiate. You don't negotiate first. You first make a move like imposing tariffs. And then if you want to negotiate, you've maximized your position to begin that. So, so I think that we should be expecting um, higher tariffs, um, addressing trade deficit issues, impacting, you know, auto trade, trade in other key sectors. We should also, in a Trump scenario, expect other types of trade disruptions, the possibility of reviving, you know, lingering sort of pause disputes on steel and aluminum, on digital services taxes, on large civil aircraft. And, and, and I do think that the EU and other economies are more likely to uh, retaliate and retaliate more quickly in response to these types of actions then under the first Trump administration where many economies had the let's wait and see, let's not make it worse uh, type type of approach, although the EU obviously did, did retaliate in a series of instances. On the Harris side, I, I think that it is, um, it, it's fair to say, I think that the EU has been relatively disappointed 
by the Biden trade policy. And, and Peter maybe touched on that implicitly in, in his opening remarks. There's been a general warming of, of, of relations, a, a much greater interest in working with partners, a much greater sense of, of common values across the Atlantic. But on trade, not that much has changed. And, and, and certainly a commitment to work together um, to fix issues at the WTO, to, to work together on the trade side of the U.S. Trade and Technology Council. Those types of issues really haven't, haven't produced much in the, the last couple of years. I, I think a lot of folks, there's not a lot of information yet about exactly where you know uh, Harris would land as president and, and her team would land as president on these issues. I, I think a lot of folks are uh, cautiously optimistic that it could be an opportunity for a, a stronger transatlantic relationship. The fact that her current national security advisor and, and, and potentially a senior national security figure in the Harris administration, Phil Gordon, is a longstanding Europe expert, has, has uh, strong relationships in, in many European capitals, combined with the possibility of um, a greater interest in doing affirmative things on trade and um, the approach that President von der Leyen has been taking as commission president, which is relatively sympathetic to a lot of U.S. priorities. Um, all of those things, I think, point to the possibility of greater cooperation. Uh, three issues that, that I'll touch on very briefly that, that I think are central. Obviously, trade and tariffs and retaliation under Trump will be the main event, but, but there are other issues to look at. One is economic security. You know, the Trump administration and the Biden administration have made economic security a top priority. Inbound investment screening, considering outbound investment screening, amping up export controls and pushing the EU and EU member states like, like the Dutch to do the same. Um, restrictions on Chinese connected vehicles, um, reporting requirements in areas like AI. These are all priorities and, and they do align to some extent with the direction where the EU has been going much more slowly, more cautiously, but under von der Leyen, the economic security strategy from last year, the economic security initiatives that were rolled out at the beginning of this year, the, the uh, statements that have been made about, about sympathy and interest in uh, issues like the security concerns about connected vehicles. There's a lot of common interest there. And, and I would expect under either a Harris or a Trump scenario, the likelihood that that continuity of interests uh, would continue. On tech policy, I, I, I think that uh, the, the Biden administration has been very cautious to go after EU tech regulation. There's a lot of criticism of the big US tech firms at home, and that, that I think has caused a, a desire not to push too hard uh, in terms of how they're treated abroad. I, I think a Trump administration would bifurcate that. They would say, we can beat up our own guys at home, but you can't beat them up abroad. And so the possibility of um, more aggressive action about concerns about the DMA, the DSA, digital services taxes, those types of issues, um, I, I, I think would be likely more prominent in a Trump scenario. And, and, and last point, the WTO. I don't think there is reason to be very optimistic under either a Trump or a Harris administration that there will be a major change in the US approach to the WTO. I think a Harris administration is likely to lean into some more incremental reform. I think a Trump administration is unlikely to withdraw from the WTO um, and, and, and will be open to continue to work on, on, on discrete issues like the e-commerce initiative. Um, but, but I think that the general US approach to the WTO and this gap between the U.S. and the EU on our level of commitment to these international rules is likely to, to continue. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, Jacob Kierkegaard has reminded me that he may need to go to audio only in a minute. So what, if you don't, you all don't mind, let me, let me hand it over to you, Jacob, so we can also have you fully with us while you give your remarks.
Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, I'm joining you from my very mobile studio here in Brussels, as you can probably see in my background. Uh, but I would I would say that I actually I agree with a lot of what what Daniel just said. So so let me perhaps instead uh, start uh, uh, from where we are in the on the macro economy because I actually think the macro uh, situation is going to shape. Uh, also the trade and broader political circumstances. And here, uh, one of the things that uh, are certain, it doesn't actually matter very much whether it's Trump or Harris, is that uh, very large U.S. federal government deficits will continue uh, probably throughout uh, the four-year period of the next president. They might be slightly larger uh, under Trump than on ha under Harris, but they're going to be very large, roughly uh, on par with what we have seen in recent years. That translates uh, to me into uh, continuing very large U.S. trade deficits. Uh, as Daniel said, this will certainly also include uh, a very large bilateral trade deficit, uh, U.S. trade deficit with the EU, uh, uh, which will be an obvious source of contention uh, with regards to uh, the, the transatlantic relationship. And I'm actually afraid that it's going to get worse because, uh, and, and again, just based on macro, because what we're, at, what we're seeing is that uh, without necessarily having a firm opinion on what the Federal Reserve will do, uh, I feel very confident in saying that uh, the ECB will continue to do what it did today, which is cut interest rate further. Uh, what that ultimately translates into, uh, in my opinion, is that uh, we're going to have an even stronger dollar. Uh, and again, this doesn't matter whether it's Harris or Trump. Uh, and that probably will make the trade deficit even larger. Oh, sorry, the bilateral trade deficit with the EU uh, almost certainly very larger. Um, and then if you start looking at the differences between uh, the two campaigns and just on macroeconomics... Um, there, I would say that uh, it's certainly my belief that uh, if Trump does, we can debate whether he actually is serious about what he says, but if he does what he says he wants to do, uh, uh, you know, tariffs themselves are inflationary. Uh, uh, but perhaps more importantly, if he does what he says he wants to do on immigration, if you are actually serious about deporting, say, a million or more people, or even threatening to do it uh, in a full employment economy, uh, you are going to have uh, a reduction of the potential labor force as part of the illegal uh, workforce in the United States are either deported or, uh, you know, driven underground. Uh, that, again, could potentially in some sectors, and here I'm talking about construction, I'm talking about agriculture, I'm talking about uh, hospitality, restaurants, etc., could be very inflationary. Uh, so basically, uh, I think the Trump macro policy, uh, on top of having potentially even larger deficit, is going to be inflationary. And uh, uh, we are then going to have a response from the Federal Reserve, which is basically going to drive up U.S. interest rates. And it's going to drive up, uh, uh, therefore, uh, the trade deficit and the dollar with it. Uh, so... Uh, in, in that sense, if Trump wins, uh, the macro imbalances and the negative impact that they have on not just the transatlantic relationship, but in my opinion, actually all of the uh, uh, the broader global trade relationships, uh, because the tariffs, ironically, aren't going to probably do very much about this. Uh, yes, they can divert uh, some trade from China to others because the tariffs in China will be in my opinion, the uh, uh, broader trade deficit are driven by the broader macro imbalances that Trump's macro policies. But uh, let's be honest, the Biden macro policies has also have made worse. Uh, so irrespective of who wins, just based on the uh, uh, outcome and the likely outcomes of the macro economies, which broadly speaking is a continually heavily uh, stimulated U.S. economy. Uh, and, a, and a European economy that slows down, close to, in my opinion, stagnation, lower interest rates, uh, uh, is uh, a, a quite troubling one. It's really one of macroeconomic divergence that spills over into, uh, obviously, a, a deteriorating trade and economic uh, relationship. Um, I don't have uh, much to add, uh, probably, on the issue of what might Trump might do. 
Uh, but certainly, uh, if he's serious about, say, uh, taking the U.S. out of the Paris Climate, Climate Accord on day one, I would uh, uh, argue that that alone will make him uh, sufficiently politically toxic uh, in the EU, that uh, retaliation, as has already uh, been uh, debated uh, in the Commission, uh, is certain and uh, uh, is likely to escalate. Uh, so you could very easily find yourself in a sort of tit-for-tat uh, situation. Um, with regards to Harris administration, on the other hand, um, my view is that uh, I think it is unlike trade, quite frankly, as the as the, as the Biden administration. I don't think that uh, people like Cath uh, Catherine Tai will continue uh, in her position. I think Harris uh, is obviously not a uh, she's not going to be the most or even the second most pro union uh, president ever, as as uh, Biden likes to say. I think she's going to have a much more nuanced. That's certainly what I get from her. Uh, uh, recent comments, interviews, Fox and other things she has done where she says she's open to uh, some uh, uh, input from Republicans. Uh, I actually think that is uh, that is likely to be the case. So I therefore uh, think that you could actually have not necessarily a, 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 a Harris administration, you know, heading back into the WTO or, or uh, going back to the Clinton or, or Obama years. But on the other hand, uh, relative to, as Daniel said, an EU that is also becoming you know, more pragmatic and less rules bound, uh, there might be more uh, to talk about. Uh, one specific issue here uh, that I certainly will be looking at is, uh, is antitrust. Uh, because I think uh, it will be very interesting to me to see what uh, whether a Harris administration maintains the appointments the Biden administration have made at the FTC, uh, and at the Justice Department. Uh, and obviously, we know uh, at the European Commission, Vice President Vestager is out, and uh, she's being replaced by a Spanish socialist uh, who may or may not have different opinions on uh, many of uh, uh, many competition or policy areas. So there again, I would suggest that uh, uh, a Harris administration might actually be less confrontational than confrontational than uh, uh, the uh, the Biden administration. Uh, uh, European trade relations has been uh, so. So let me stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Jacob. Let me hand it over now to Laura Fontanes. Um, thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you too. Um... For your previous uh, statements, I think I'm going to follow up a little bit on what uh, Jacob already did, is which is uh, talking a little bit more about the EU side. And um, well, doing that, of course, uh, it's obviously the case that the outcome of the US election matters for the EU side. It does so directly, or it would, if uh, Trump comes into power. Um, that's already been mentioned. Uh, Daniel uh, spoke uh, about uh, the tariff measures in place, but there are other measures as well, talking about uh, export controls, investment controls, and so on. So there's a whole agenda, I think, that um, would be uh, readily set into motion, and um, that might not be entirely in the best interest of the European Union member states. So that would be a direct effect. The tariffs, obviously, a global uh, tariff of 10 uh, to 20 percent, perhaps a, a resurfacing of a steel and aluminum taxes and so on uh, tariffs. I also think that uh, with Trump in power, there would be um, an indirect effect of uh, major importance um, on the transatlantic economic relationship, which is through his impact on the Ukraine war. I mean, him, Trump, having uh, negotiated a deal, if we think about that, uh, with uh, Putin uh, on the future of Ukraine, uh, that is very likely to lead uh, to vast economic costs uh, for the EU member states or European members of NATO. Uh, and not just, it's not just about the political, uh, about the economic costs, obviously, it's also about the political costs um, that we would have to Face and that would create create huge challenges for sort of intra-European uh, coordination, not only on economic policy, but then I think everyone would would be preoccupied with um, uh, 
finding solutions to the security dilemma that we're facing. Um, so there are these two obvious uh, effects that Trump would have on our transatlantic relationship. Um, then, of course, it's also uh, very important to look uh, towards Congress. I mean, we are all aware that uh, Trump, even if he uh, came back into power, could not do uh, or implement everything and anything he likes to do right away. That is also a huge role for the U.S. Congress to play. And it very much uh, depends on the outcome of the uh, races in the Senate and the House. And I think even under a Trump presidency, Congress could play that role that it already did during Trump's first presidency, which is reminding uh, him uh, of the costs of uh, playing against your allies rather than uh, in uh, cooperation with your allies if your main security uh, challenge or um, preference, uh, security policy preference is really China, uh, there's good reasons to remind Trump um, that he needs to get to some degree of um, cooperation with EU uh, member states on that. And uh, he might even listen. Uh, we don't know. So uh, with this uh, said about the US side, I would like to switch over to the European Union side, which is, I, I don't know to what extent people are aware of this, but Although the EU parliamentary elections are over, we're still facing or potentially facing um, uh, very important domestic races in the member states. And Germany is certainly one candidate with uh, scheduled elections for next fall. But as it happens at this point in time, there's much speculation on whether we would end up in a scenario with early elections, perhaps already at the beginning of 2025. So that might have an impact. And I, I don't think um, that many people are um, wondering about uh, the outcome of the, the next French presidential elections yet, but for the inner European um, uh, relationships, these two countries, Germany and France, obviously uh, the elections in our two countries uh, will play a huge role on uh, the extent to which we will be capable of finding common ground, finding common responses to an adversive, potentially adversive um, policy coming from the US or from other countries. I mean, uh, it's uh, that, that the same obviously goes for any kind of um, non-benevolent uh, uh, economic policies coming out of China and other um, yeah, countries, trade partners. So, it goes without saying that a political instability that might um, be uh, surrounding elections in the US as well as in Europe uh, could weigh heavily on the transatlantic relationship um, because uncertainty um, is bad for business, obviously. It's bad uh, for business, but also it's, it's bad for the overall economy because it leads to governments and bureaucracies also regular citizens being preoccupied with political uh, fights and partisan political fights rather than um, tackling the huge challenges that we are facing. And I mean, we could probably just look back on the agenda um, four years ago or two years ago after the midterm elections in the US. I think that the uh, obvious challenges we found there in the transatlantic relationship are still um, to work on. That includes um, finding peace uh, in, in Europe, in Ukraine, uh, but also in other parts of the world, uh, just mentioning Gaza, Sudan, and so on. But also taking the steps necessary, uh, obviously, to uh, reduce climate change. Um, there's still lots of things that we have to do together and in a coordinated way. Um, and also prepare our uh, economies and societies for huge changes related to digitalization, automization of production, obviously uh, artificial intelligence playing a bigger and bigger role um, in uh, all kinds of human relations. So if I look at the transatlantic relationship in 2025, um, and I will uh, focus on a cooperative scenario here, which is to say I focus on Harris, I think there's already uh, lots of things um, that we heard about uh, a Trump uh, presidency, so I focus on the Harris EU scenario. I think all of the areas that I just uh, mentioned um, could be worked on, 
I think we already defined the institutional framework for it. So there are various high level economic dialogues um, on energy, on data. Uh, obviously there's uh, um, the whole uh, trade and technology council framework, which would allow for a continuous, uh, for continuously working on these uh, subject matters. Um, I'm not so sure about the multilateral uh, trades agenda and to what extent there's an uh, appetite on the US side, if it still exists to work on uh, WTO reform. Um, but certainly on all of the other areas, there's lots of things to discuss. Um, but given the US focus, strategic focus on China, and given that we do have overlapping interests between the EU and the US, on security, on economic security. I think this would be an obvious thing to start working on together, collaboratively, um, at least in a coordinated way. Uh, I think that's perhaps the minimum standard that we should reach. And in order uh, to be able to do that, I think some that there needs some more work to be done, both on the US side and on the EU side, on defining what we mean by economic security. Um, that's my last remark. I think uh, Dalip Singh uh, put it well in, in at least a couple of speeches he gave on the need for uh, US wanting to lead uh, and be a leader in this uh, domain, um, that it needs to take on the responsibility for defining what it means by economic security, it's also defining the limits of it. And then maybe we can find common ground on that. And um, just uh, let me finish by saying that obviously on the EU side, there's lots of work to be done as well. Um, the European Commission, I think, is, is aware of the challenge and it set uh, sort of the first um, steps. It has taken the first steps, uh, steps towards uh, an economic security agenda. Um, but uh, Obviously, in, in absence of um, what I would call a true Hamiltonian moment on the EU side, it will be a very tall order to get there. So lots of work to do uh, in terms of coordinating member state policy uh, policies, uh, perhaps giving up um, sovereignty, uh, allowing the Commission and other uh, EU level actors to really uh, take control of certain policy files. Um, so lots of work to do uh, in case Harris gets elected, and uh, I leave it there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Laura. Penny, over to you now, please. Great. Well, I think a lot has been said, so I will keep my remarks uh, brief, and I will focus on a few things that we haven't touched on so far. So on November 5th, I will be uh, getting up at 4 a.m. in the morning to go be a poll worker here in the United States. Um, I have to report for duty at 5 a.m. and I work until uh, all the votes are counted in my precinct. Uh, I usually get home around 9 p.m. at night. And um, while the presidential election gets a lot of the press, um, there are um, a lot of down ballot races that are really important, not just for um, the local elections and the local um, and where U.S. citizens are showing up to vote, but are also important for some of our international relations. So um, when I think about what's going on with the, pres the presidents, while there are certain things they can do with their executive action, there are many things that they will have to work with Congress and or with states and their legislatures to get uh, through. And so watching what's going on in Congress is incredibly important. So in the Senate at the moment, um, which is a 50-50 split with Vice President Harris having to come in and vote on any um, piece of legislation that is uh, a true party line vote, um, we may see the Senate um, at the moment, based on current polling, move towards the Republican camp. Uh, West Virginia, uh, a seat currently held by Senator Manchin, is likely to move to Republicans, and a seat out in Montana, uh, currently held by Senator Tester, is currently polling as um, likely Republican. So that would move the Senate into being a, a, a Republican um, held, um, with the Republicans uh, then holding the rights with regards to confirmations, treaty um, mm -hmm. obligations, various other things. 
uh, which and, and also the approval of most judge confirmations would go through the Senate. So those are three really important things, I think, that impact also some of our transatlantic folks. Meanwhile, the House is polling very closely at the moment. Currently, it's Republican held, but there are some that think that it could move to being Democratic. Again, I think the odds are quite close at the moment, but there are scenarios where you could see um, a split um, a split Congress with Democrats holding the House and the Republicans holding the Senate. Americans generally like to keep um, our parties in balance. While we don't have coalition governments in the United States, it is not as common to have one party hold both the presidency and both houses of Congress. And I think that that is because Americans generally, um, maybe not consciously, but like to have a break on, um, on uh, absolute power by one party. So that is something to keep an eye on um, because there are gonna be some things that are gonna have to go up and go through the Congress. So renewal of US, um, Mexico and the Canada agreement will take place in 2026. That is a piece of trade legislation that is important for global supply chains. And that work on that will begin in 2025. That will be important, I think, for also the transatlantic relationship based on how the U.S. makes some changes around the treatment of products coming in from Mexico, in particular cars, but also other products. Um, and we'll be looking at the issues around some of the supply chains and the absolute ownership of where those things stand moving forward. Um, uh, a second thing I would point to would be the state um, and local races. So there is a lot of European investment in the United States. And frankly, it is the state and local authorities that um, sometimes can play a more determinative role in the investment conditions for European investment in the U.S. And in particular, I think we're going to see a lot of the states, particularly the Republican-held states, argue that the IRA funding and some of the work that they're doing to decarbonize uh, our energy system in the United States will be something that needs to be retained post-election and that may make it more challenging for the executive, um, if it is Trump, to roll back some of the climate legislation that um, the Biden administration has passed. So um, a last thing I would say is, is that I think that the states also are playing a really interesting role at the moment um, and could play an even more interesting role with regards to trade. And there have been um, some MOUs that states have been signing. State governors tend to be, even if they're Republicans, more pro-trade and more pro-investment than their national parties. And you can see some really interesting developments taking place at the state level. So depending on what happens, and I think there will be some apathy in general towards the transatlantic relationship post-election, um, by either party, maybe a more active apathy by the Trump administration than the Harris administration. But you, but looking a, a level down at state and local governments, I think will become important for um, folks that are looking at maintaining uh, their investment and trade connections between the US and the EU um, post-election. So let me stop there, Peter, because I think we've touched on some of the other big things like tax, which will be a very big bill with a lot of international ramifications that will have to go through the Congress. And if it is divided, um, we'll, we'll put a break on either president in terms of their absolute ability to make some of the tax changes that they're both discussing at the moment. So thank you. Thanks, Penny. Uh, let me remind uh, the viewers that if you'd like to ask a question, I encourage you to do so. Uh, please use the Q&A tab and I'll make sure to relay it to our panelists. Let, let me start with a kind of thought experiment under either Harris or a Trump uh, administration. Um, uh, Jacob, you mentioned the Paris Agreement. Uh, Laura, you mentioned climate. I think, Penny, you did as well. So why don't I... <clears throat> Why don't I start there? And I'm what what prompts me to do that is that in 2026, so right in the middle of the next presidential term, the EU will be uh, moving to uh, sort of real implementation of its carbon border adjustment mechanism, uh, which taxes uh, carbon intensive imports and to sort of uh, balance out the EU's um, emissions trading system. Uh, where companies have to buy carbon uh, credits. 
Um, in the United States, in the Congress, which you mentioned, um, Penny, we've seen both Democrats and Republicans put forward bills that are, but that would that would launch some kind of first cousin, or depending if it's a Republican or Democratic bill, maybe a more distant cousin from the from the EU CBAM. Uh, I say that because the de- I think on the Democratic side you would have an att- these bills have an attempt to I- include a carbon tax that would sort of mirror what the EU does with the emissions trading system. With some of the Republican bills might not, but both of them would put uh, taxes on carbon and intensive imports. Uh, I think that is, and again, more depending whether it's a Democrat or Republican bill, it probably has more or less to do only with with the climate and 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 more or less to do also with with China and its exports. But my my question is, you know, this is going to happen, um, and it is not impossible that U.S. exports to the EU will face tariffs um, once the CBAM is fully up and running. How do you think a Harris or Trump administration would react? Daniel, you want to give us a stab at that? Happy to start. I mean, I, I think that a Trump administration is, is likely to react more negatively and more, more directly with um, accusations about the 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 problems that that mechanism creates and and, and the imposition of um, counter uh, tariffs and and you could see a 301 investigation you could see other other mechanisms brought into play based on the idea that this is an unfair discriminatory or unreasonable you know way to treat uh, trade w- w- with the U.S. and and I I think the greater skepticism on the climate issues in the context of a future Trump administration, I, I think would would contribute to a, a pretty free hand to kind of fight that on the trade side. I, I, I think it is less certain in a Harris context, because as you've said, I, I obviously there, there's a greater prioritization of the climate agenda. And um, there is consideration within the U.S. of not the, the same but, but but mechanisms that could move in 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 similar directions. So, so I think there's uncertainty there. But I might I might turn to fellow panelists and see see where they where their thoughts go on that. Would anyone else like to uh, venture a, a thought about that? Peter, if I could jump oh, in, just yeah. please lock up. You want to? Okay. So um uh. Just to say that I think that um, I agree generally with Daniel. Part of it is is that the way CBAM is currently being implemented is incredibly complex. Um, And I think that um, there will need to be some changes made in 2025 to the current way that the EU is implementing CBAM. Some of those changes, if negotiated properly with partners around the world, may ease some of the trade concerns that I think Daniel has identified. Um, uh, but the EU is currently consulting on whether downstream products should be included in uh, the CBAM. And so um, that decision will be, I think, quite impactful as well in terms of the breadth and the depth of the scope of of CBAM and what it does. But at the end of the day, I actually think both the Harris and the Trump administration may want to um, join common cause with the EU around some of these carbon border adjustment schemes. We've tried to do it with the Global Steel Arrangement. That's run into a few roadblocks. But um, in general, there is um, some commonality of purpose for different reasons. One is to block Chinese imports coming into the United States for the Trump folks. But for the Harris folks, it's more about the climate side. But looking at this issue is something that I think continues to um, percolate in both sides of the um, the camps and is something that, um, yes, could result in trade tensions if done awkwardly, um, but could also be something that could be an area of joint work, regardless of who wins in the White House, depending on how the Europeans approach it and approach the administration. Great, thanks. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, Peter, this is Jacob. Sorry. Okay, Jacob, go ahead. We know you're at a 
Okay, you know, yeah, thank you. So no, I'm glad I, to hear you wanna, with this. Thank you. I just want to emphasize, uh, you know, underline what Penny just said, namely that the EU is uh, already considering the extent to which downstream products uh, should be included uh, in CBAM. Uh, there's also uh, an entirely additional uh, set of sectors, road transportation, buildings, etc., that will be covered by carbon pricing in the EU by 2027, 2028. Uh, so what this means is that, uh, in my opinion, at least, that, uh, you know, CBAM is only going to go in one direction. It's going to be expanding. Uh, uh, and and with it, uh, the scope for transatlantic trade friction, you know, quite, in my opinion, quite obviously uh, increases. Um, and uh, there, in terms of how this gets resolved, uh, I actually think that a big joker here uh, is is highly geopolitical. Uh, if there is still a war going on in Ukraine uh, and the U.S. continues to provide uh, critical military support for uh, Ukraine, I think there will be, you know, uh, uh, ways in which this can at least be postponed, if you like. Um, but if the war is over uh, or, for that matter, uh, Trump has tried to impose some sort of you know, in the eyes of the EU, clearly uh, pro-Russian uh, peace settlement, I think the political willingness to, uh, uh, you know, postpone or finesse uh, CBAM in a transatlantic context will be zero. Uh, so, so that's certainly an important sort of indicator that I would be watching. Thank you. Thanks. Laura. Yeah, I, I can only agree. I think uh, there's a certain uh, risk that Trump might pick this up um, because uh, something like CBAM, an acronym like that, coming from Europe could be an easy target, right? So um, easy to uh, to shoot at. Um, and although I, it's true what Penny said about um, ideas about uh, various forms of border adjustment mechanisms, taxes, we heard much of that early on in the first Trump presidency, not related to climate, but nevertheless plans for a, um, a border um, a mechanism in, in on taxes. And I think if I recall correctly, Trump ended uh, this debate saying it's that it is too complicated and he prefers tariffs, right? So uh, I think it's probably a valid uh, expectation that this could happen again and that we will not see a Republican EU um, a negotiation uh, on a rational um, sort of a deal making um, that would lead to common policy making, but uh, rather a big transatlantic fight over um, supposedly green or in the language of uh, Donald Trump, woke policies are coming from the EU and so sort of ruining the US uh, economy. Although I think uh, perhaps it should be mentioned, all of the analysis I've, I've seen on effects of CBAM on the US economy never indicate that there would be a big uh, detrimental effect on the US economy. I think that's, that's a fact. Thank you, Laura. Let me um, <clears throat> zoom out to the uh, multilateral level for a second. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm right that, that most or all of you said that whether it's Harris or Trump, the U.S. is unlikely to invest very much in the World Trade Organization. Um, and so with that we sort of take should take that as a given. If you're sitting in Brussels or capitals in Europe, you should you should you know that should be your starting point and how you think about your one of your starting points and how you think about your trade policy and and sort of how the U.S. fits. And so my 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 question would be, I mean, let me just sort of first want to make sure you all agree on that. And and what it, and, and and maybe what what is U.S. a lack of U.S. investment in, in the WTO? You know, mean is it is it is it under Trump? Would it be even more than we saw him do in the first term? Would it be even more sort of uh, uh, contentious with the WTO? Would the Harris administration maybe lean in a little more? But you'd still qualify it as kind of you know maybe you know, a kind of dis, dis lack of investment. And if and if the answer is yeah, they're not, neither is going to do very much. 
what difference does that make? And and if they and if it's let's say a Harris administration where we could probably expect more cooperation with the EU, um, would there be a need on I would the EU, for example, feel a need to to use that word again, invest in the transatlantic relationship as a way to make up for the fact that we're all now taking as a given that the WTO is a place that will will sort of be the subject of at best benign neglect. Any anyone want to offer a thought about the WTO? Daniel? Happy to start. I'm, I'm sure others have thoughts as well. I mean, I, I think first from a US perspective, I, I think it's important to kind of look at this question with the frame that U.S. concerns about the WTO and broader concerns about the WTO didn't begin with this election. You, you know, the concerns that the U.S. has had on the dispute settlement and the appellate body in particular, and the concerns that I think most or many in the membership have about the limits and the constraints on the rulemaking side and the fact that India, for example, can, can block any effort to create a plurilateral agreement among folks who, who may wish to do so. Um, I, I think whatever one's view on those issues, you know, there are serious debates that precede, um, you, know, you know, Trump or Harris or, or, or Biden. I, I, I do think that under a future Trump administration, I, I, I would be surprised if there's a move to withdraw from the WTO, as, as, as I said earlier. Um, I do think that we saw under Trump that there was a, an openness to working together with countries in limited ways at the WTO on issues where there was a common interest and, and then the possibility to show that we don't oppose everything about this institution. We oppose certain specific things that we're trying to change. And Are the, you thinking of the trilateral initiative, USEU Japan, for example, on, on, on subsidies and other things? Is, is that what you have in mind when you say that? Two things. Um, I was thinking of the e-commerce joint statement initiative that the U.S. joined when, uh, you know, Ambassador Lighthizer went to, you know, the Buenos Aires ministerial. And I was also thinking about that trilateral, which I think was a serious conversation between, you know, the EU, Japan and the U.S. about um, how the WTO and other actions um, could be aligned to deal with these kind of major global systemic issues. And there, I think you did see this debate about rules versus tools. And I think the EU lean was always, you, you know, uh, we need to show that international rules can effectively solve these problems, including systemic concerns with regard to China's role in the global trading system. I think the U.S. perspective always was um, the main thing we each need to do is not be bound by those rules but um, sharpen unilateral uh, tools that can be coordinated to go more effectively after those issues. But those are not mutually exclusive. Let me pause and, and, and let others jump in. Thank you. Would anyone else like to offer a thought on WTO? If I could just really quickly, Penny. Peter, um, mm -hmm. when I think about, when I think about, you know, the fact if, if, if either political party wanted to withdraw from the WTO, you would be creating kind of a, a global Brexit situation that would require uh, renegotiating in particular tra our trading relationships at the most basic level with a couple of our largest trading partners, Europe in particular, as well as China um, and, and many others where we don't have free trade agreements, we just operate on the WTO rules. So there's a lot of mechanics of international trade that run on that, that I think if disrupted would be also very disruptive to um, the current um, desire to do certain things uh, on the economic front and would divert attention from those towards having to negotiate new agreements with all of these countries. Now, there might be a desire and a belief that you could get more advantageous uh, terms individually with countries on a one-by-one -one basis, but I think that that is something that um, would be quite a shock to the system as we saw kind of in a micro version when the UK pulled out of the EU. Um, I do think it's really um, notable, as Daniel said, that in the United States, everybody talks about China and the focus is on China. But if you're in Geneva, it's all about India 
and the fact that India doesn't necessarily um, play in a way that is about the greater good, which is what the WTO is really about, and instead plays very much in a way that's about its kind of individual interest. And I find that to actually be more disruptive and a topic of conversation than some of the other topics that we've been talking about today in Geneva and an issue that needs to be really hammered out in part because, as Daniel said, you know, we can't even get an, an agreement with 125 members on investment facilitation to get approved because India is leading two other countries and blocking that from becoming part of WTO rules that they will benefit up from without having to make any commitments of their own to abide by. So I think it will continue to just kind of exist, but maybe not at a very high level. And it will continue to be a place for convenings and discussions and for some um, appropriate work to be completed up, but not necessarily, um, we're not gonna see any big rounds that come out of this that will update the international rules per se. Could, could I follow up on that with, with you and, and maybe with Daniel? I mean, would it be fair to say that India is a challenge when it comes to the liberalization side, but China is a challenge when it comes to rewriting the rules for things like uh, dispute settlement, national security, climate. Is that, is, that a, is that a fair characterization or is that too broad? I think that what... Um... I have my personal opinion on this, Peter, is that, and I'll um, defer to Daniel as the expert, but um, uh, uh, if you look at the WTO rules, for example, on subsidies, um, you have to be, subsidies have to be specific in order to be actionable in most cases. So specific me, and, and a lot of the Chinese subsidies are, for example, industry-wide, or they in some way are written in a way that they skirt the WTO rules. And so it's not that they're breaking the rules, it's that they're working within the construct of the rules to create and to do what they're doing. So the rules need to be redrafted to take into account some of the things that are being done. But I think where there's an existential question is that India is blocking anything from moving except at the consensus level. And for an organization with, you know, the number of members that the WTO has and the differences in economic levels, it, that's not something that works. And so the ability to move forward in a coalition of the willing or a plurilateral context consistently being blocked by India um, uh, because they want certain other things to be addressed that are in their national interest is incredibly problematic for the global consensus around trade. I'll just yeah. offer one comment. I, I, I agree yeah, with, with the framing that, that, that Penny just, just made on those points. That the other other thought that I had, it goes to your your the last part of your question, Peter, about you know, if the WTO goes on, you know, what is its relevance in either of these scenarios? I, I think that if you had a scenario, you, you know, with a second Trump administration that doesn't pull out of the WTO, which, as I said, I don't expect, but that does impose 10% global tariffs and 60% tariffs on China. And, 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 and you know, you, you have a scenario in which the limited relevance of the WTO on the central trade issues of a generation becomes kind of the main, main story without anyone withdrawing from Geneva. Yeah. Got it. Let me, um, oh, Laura, sorry, please. Yes. No, and just, uh, I think all the relevant points have already been made on the WTO, but perhaps the domestic policy dimension. Um, and uh, perhaps uh, from a European uh, perspective, it, there's some reason to worry about developments in the US Congress. So it's not just about uh, the next president and whether it's Trump or not. But um, if you look at policy recommendations uh, of the um, Select House Committee on uh, China, um, if you listen in on debates uh, on uh, withdrawing PNTR, um, if we uh, talk about other measures, you know there could be damage to the WTO without the US actually leaving it. Um, there could be. Uh, could be having very long-lasting uh, negative consequences. I think that's 
uh, fair to say, and and that probably explains the worries we have. So we we see sort of uh, um, the double or combined forces of a Trump presidency and a Congress uh, with bipartisan consensus on on that sort of policy. Great, thanks. Um, let me. Um take a question from one of our viewers. And Jacob, I think I'm going to hand it off to you. The question is, um, what would happen to the US-EU relationship, but also sort of to the global economy, if President Trump exerted more sway over the Fed, as he has suggested, suggested he would like to do? Well, that takes us into the realm of the role of the dollar uh, in the international financial system, the role of the U.S. Treasury market as the ultimate, if you like, safe haven asset in crises. Uh, so this is, uh, first of all, something that goes well beyond the transatlantic relationship. Um, and I will say that uh, if, if Trump does that, uh, if he basically tries to exert direct uh, uh, sort of influence on on what the Fed does beyond he's obviously going to be able to appoint some members subject to Senate confirmation. I mean, we have to remember he actually appointed Jay Powell, right? Um, but it's it's you know so there is possibility. It's a possibility that that he might actually end up uh, also knowing what might pass, uh, you know, even a Senate confirmation process that the Fed might uh, escape, quote unquote, some of the more politicized potential appointees. That's certainly the experience you had from 2016, but that's really up to the composition of the Senate. But uh, I will certainly say that if Trump tried to do, you know, shall we say an Erdogan, right, uh, that basically having uh, a Fed that certainly in my reading, as I said earlier, of the macroeconomic policies that Trump espouses would lead to Fed the Fed likely having to raise interest rates, uh, a stronger dollar, uh, uh, which is not something that Trump uh, uh, has has previously espoused, especially if it is, as it works directly in the opposite way of, of his tariff uh, uh, proposals. Uh, what would that do? Uh, no, it would obviously undermine market faith in uh, the, as I said, the function and role of the U.S. dollar in the international system. This could potentially, of course, uh, uh, lead to significantly higher interest rates uh, uh, in the United States and, and as such would clearly backfire because Trump would presumably want to uh, try to achieve the opposite. Uh, um, but having said that, uh, unless Trump uh, managed to actually, uh, co you know, coerce the Fed into doing something that that clearly a majority of the FOMC wouldn't like it to do, say cut interest rates when they wanted to 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 hike them, for instance, or something like that. Uh, absent that, and, and and then the following mass resignation of FOMC uh, members or other type of very high profile confrontation over uh, monetary policy, and basically Congress stepping back and saying, oh, this Federal Reserve Act that we actually control, we're not going to do anything about that. Uh, uh, so there... If, if that were to happen, those kinds of wild-eyed scenarios, yeah, then I think uh, it could do real damage to the uh, uh, to the role of the U.S. dollar. Uh, but short of that, and I certainly couldn't imagine that even a, a, a you know a Republican-controlled Congress would just sit back and let Trump uh, uh, you know basically run uh, roughshod over uh, the Federal Reserve Act. Uh, so again, I think this would be very bad for, uh, uh, you know, U.S. macroeconomic policy and management overall. But as I said, I don't act, I think the threshold for Trump actually succeeding, first of all, in what he would be trying to achieve would be almost impossible, actually, because I don't think he could force the Fed to, uh, uh, raise interest rates and even if, sorry, lower interest rate, and even, even if he did, markets would drive up, uh, uh longer rates, uh, but even, you know, I, again, I don't think Congress would sit on its hands and just let him do it, even if it was a Republican Congress. So I, I think the probability there, for, even by the way, even if all this succeeded, where would global investors go? You know, they wouldn't go to the euro market. They, the renminbi is non-convertible. So we're back to the dollar being the only really credible currency out there that can serve this function. So 
ultimately, I think the threshold for these types of scenarios is extremely high. Thanks. Anyone else on that one? If if uh, if not, let me uh, share another question for one of the viewers. Uh, we've talked a bit about China, of course, but maybe not um, kind of directly in terms of the, how it how it affects the dynamic between the U.S. and the EU and their ability to cooperate. So the question is, you know, to what degree under either Harris under Harris or Trump administration, but I, I guess the presumption is even, you know, particularly under a Trump administration, um, you know, can China be a unifying factor and uh, would the EU be ready? How far would the EU be ready to go to make China a unifying factor uh, as a way of preserving the transatlantic relationship? Laura, maybe I'm going to ask you to start on that that's okay uh sure yeah happy to do that um so i think it it could be a unifying factor and it would certainly be on the menu of things that um what the eu commission or the member states even would uh, suggest should be uh, um uh, yeah discussed between a trump administration and uh the european um union um i think there's a, a, a fundamental, um, uh, fundamentally different understanding of what should be part of the uh, toolkit um, to use uh, between the US and the EU. So I think by now we see a European Commission that is um, ready and preparing steps to improve investment screening controls of money coming into the EU. Uh, talk about do we use good export controls, um, extend the scope, even go beyond uh, traditional definitions uh, in the interest of certain foreign and security policy goals. Then when you get to tariffs, which is really the relevant part, I think there's a fundamental uh, opposition against using tariffs as an economic security policy tool or instrument and you've seen that uh, very vividly uh, taking place uh, in the um, what, de de debate prior to the EU Commission uh, implementing um, EV tariffs on China, right? So with a member state like Germany really not only abstaining from the vote, but making it a point that uh, Germany is against uh, tariffs, I think that was uh, a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good proof of um, the divisions you will definitely find within the member states um, on whether to proceed on this uh, agenda. At the same time, it's the most interesting and relevant part uh, for seen from the US perspective, right? um, because that is where the EU as a trade bloc and single market could really have an impact on China and really uh, contribute to a common economic security strategy or statecraft uh, strategy. Thanks. J Jacob, you'd like to offer a thought. Yeah, I mean, I, I think actually, uh, you know, the extent to which China will play a role in the transatlantic relationship obviously is critically determined by the EU-China relationship. Uh, and there, again, I would come back to the war in Ukraine. Uh, uh, as long as China continues to be uh, Russia's main external supplier of everything dual use, uh, there are. Uh, I, I'm very skeptical that the, the current Chinese uh, EU relationship can get uh, any warmer, almost irrespective of uh, whether it's a Harris or a Trump administration. Uh, the EU simply won't deal with, uh, 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 you know, at the political level. Uh, and a uh, China that actively is supporting uh, the Russian war effort. On the other hand, again, if, if China were to scale back uh, such support or if the war were to end, uh, uh, that could very well change, uh, in my opinion. But I think, uh, you know, if we just take a look at what um, is happening very recently, uh, you know, the big issue has, of course, been uh, EU tariffs on EVs. Uh, they are coming, in my opinion, um, but uh, they are coming at a, you know, at least in principle, WTO compliant uh, fashion. They are much, much lower, obviously, than the essentially prohibitively high tariffs from uh, uh, the Biden administration on, on Chinese EVs. Uh, 
Uh, the EU's uh, tariffs are explicitly designed, in my opinion, to bring forward or facilitate further uh, Chinese EV investments in Europe and therefore uh, further promote the integration of uh, the Chinese and European uh, EV sectors. Uh, and here I would just also point out that all the all the major E European car producers, Volkswagen, BMW, Daimler, Stellantis, they all have a Chinese uh, EV strategic partner uh, here that develops, for instance, software. Uh, what that means is that the, the notion that the EU, I know that there are people in Brussels who have done you know, uh, trial balloons on this, that the EU would somehow follow uh, the US logic on connected vehicle, for instance, the data uh, privacy and, and data protection uh, agenda, I regard that probability as essentially zero. Uh, so again, uh, uh, the, you know, there are therefore uh, also limitations to how far the uh, US-EU collaboration against China can, can proceed. Thank you. Great, one last question, uh, which is kind of, uh putting together a couple from, from viewers. Then uh, that follows on from what we just discussed. And that is, when we look at, when we look at China and the EU's readiness to deal with China, it has come up with a number of, uh, let's say use the word tools that was used before, uh, the anti-coercion instrument, the uh, these new anti-subsidies rule, the uh, procurement initiative. Um, but in principle, those are, those are country neutral, right? They're there. And in fact, maybe even one of them was, inspired, let's use that word, by the Trump administration. Um, how, how do it, you see uh, the these EU tools? Are they, um, are, do, you know, if, if, if Trump comes in, do you think that the EU would, that the, 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 the maybe for political, domestic political reasons in, inside a number of countries in the EU, would there be a lot of pressure to use those on the US and how much pressure would there be compared to the um, interest in using those against China? I'm looking at our two Europeans to start at least if you case. Okay, Jacob, please. No, I, I don't, I mean, beyond CBAM, uh, I mean, I think the EU, you know, they've already allegedly at least identified uh, uh, categories in which they will retaliate uh, against Trump tariffs. Uh, but that is not different from what we saw at Boeing Airbus. I mean, this is this is, quote unquote, the standard WTO uh, playbook. Um, I don't necessarily I don't I couldn't imagine scenarios where uh, the EU would uh, actively pursue uh, say an anti-subsidy investigation against the U.S. product or other of the specific trade remedies that, uh, yes, they're country neutral, but uh, they're, they're, I, I don't think they could really uh, uh, be used against uh, a, a country like the United States, uh, simply because of the the lack of, of many of these types of policies, uh, unlike, of course, in the case of, of, um, of China. I don't, for instance, think that any, on under any plausible scenarios I can think of that the EU could say begin an investigation into the IRA uh, or, or, or uh, any plausible other uh, federal government inspired uh, uh, you know subsidy scheme for I mean the CHIPS Act for instance either I mean the EU has copied it uh, so I think that probability is uh, again even under a Trump administration uh, uh, a zero but on the other hand, the, the likelihood of an EU retaliation against, uh, you know, across the board terrorists from Trump, I think that that probability is 100. Um, but but on China, I would just say that I think, uh, yes, there's going to be some tit for tat. Uh, you know, it might well be that, that, I mean, as I said, I think EV tariffs are coming. Uh, I think the Chinese will retaliate. Uh, they're going to, okay, they, they targeted brandy. They might target German sports cars. Spanish pork, uh, Irish dairy, and and maybe some other things, but those types of retaliations I regard as, uh, you know, sort of theatrical. Uh, 
Uh, they are not targeting strategic sectors. They're meant to be, in principle, WTO compliant. So there'll be a five-year investigation in a bilat in the new. Uh, I forgot the acronym for it, the new bilateral, uh, in you know, dispute settlement, voluntary dispute settlement mechanism, uh, uh, and then they'll probably go away. Uh, so this is not the entry into a full-blown trade war between the EU and China. Neither, neither side wants it. Uh, certainly not the Chinese, because the bilateral trade surplus that China runs with the EU is like, what, 400 billion euros or something like that. So, Anyone else before we sign off? Laura? Yeah, I, I agree um, with what Jacob said. Certainly, I think in, in Germany, there's no appetite for using... Um, those new EU instruments against the United States. Oh, on the other hand, during the first presidency, uh, Trump's presidency, we saw a lot of those will never happen um, uh, things uh, change quickly. Um, my sense is it wouldn't even just depend on what is going on in the US, uh, but also, um, as I said initially, sort of the indirect effects of the US withdrawing security uh, protection uh, for Europe, um, taking uh, yeah an unhelpful um, path regarding Ukraine, uh, that might change people's mindsets. I think that's uh, at least a, a fringe risk um, that we need to keep in mind. All right. Well, uh, with that, let me thank all of you, uh, our, our panelists today, for, for sharing your terrific insights. Let me thank... Um, Viewers for for tuning in. I I in in as I said in about a little less than three weeks we'll have the election. I don't. I'm not sure that our discussion reduced any of the uncertainty about the outcome. But I I'm I'm fairly sure it's helped us to understand the uh, the stakes uh, when it comes to the uh, transatlantic economy and maybe even helped us to uh, prepare a bit for uh, for what's coming. So with that, let me thank you all. For again, for tuning in, wish you uh, a great rest of your day wherever you are. Bye bye.